Welcome to the fifth WRA Young Scientist Forum. Under the WRA Young's Development Series, this is the WRA Young Scientist Forum Physics and the Material Science section. My name is He Tian from Tsinghua University. I'm truly honored to have the opportunity to host our section. The forms bring together today's the most outstanding young scientists. We are focused on the displaying the most cutting edge scientific achievements and progress trends. It also promotes exchange and understanding between scientists of different generations, inspiring new academic ideas and jointly promoting scientific progress. This section will focus on the native research in the preparation and the characterization of no dimensional materials. New micro and nano electronics and optical devices. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping notes. Today's section is being recorded to be available for reviewing post conference. Our section is divided into two parts. In the first part, each young scientist takes turns to give a speech on their latest research in five minutes to 10 minutes. After each speech, Loris will have five minutes to give comments on the speech. On the second part, each young scientist can prepare one question to ask the Loris or on a specified Loris. If you have any technical questions, please reach out directly to the Zoom host where the chat function. Now, I take the advantages of this moment to introduce the four Loris who came to this conference in alphabetical order of family name. They are Sir Andrew Gam is one of the 2010 Nobel Prize in Physics for discovering the graphene. He is the Regents Professor and the Royal Society Research Professor at the University of Manchester. He has received many international awards and the distinctions include the John Carty Prize from the US National Academy of Science and the Cobbler Medal from the Royal Society. Most notably, he was awarded the 2010 Nobel Prize in Physics for his groundbreaking working on graphene. Serge Harachi was awarded the 2012 Nobel Prize for Physics. Harachi is a professor at the College de France and holds the chair of the quantum physics. He has designed the ingenious experiments to study the quantum phenomena when he was designed matter and light interaction, he has made an important contribution for groundbreaking experiments and methods that enable measuring and manipulation of individual quantum systems. Wolf Kettler was awarded the 2001 Nobel Laureate in Physics. He is a John D. MacArthur Professor of Physics, Director of MIT Harvard Center for Ultra Cold Atoms. Manchester Institute of uh, Technology, MIT. He has made important contributions for the achievements of the boson einstein condensation in the dilute gas of the alkali atoms, and for the early fundamental studies of the properties of the constants. Alan H. McDonald was awarded the 2020 Wolf Prize Laureate in Physics. He is the Sid World Richardson Foundation Regents Chair in Physics, University of Texas. His primary research interest centers on the influence of the electron interactions on the electrochemical properties of metal and the semiconductors. He proposed the magic angle of 1.1 degree graphene with a special type of superconductivity. And now, Let's start the first part of our section. In this part, each young scientist take turn to give a speech on their latest research in five minutes. After each speech, laureates will have five minutes to give comments on their speech. President Wang, let's welcome our first presenter, Hui Jing, who will be speaking to us on the circuit of high TC superconductors in the strange metal states. Professor Jing is the group leader and the deputy director of the National Lab for Superconductivity in the Institute of Physics, IOP, Chinese Academy of Science. 
Professor Jin's groups are devoted to developing the techni techniques of epitaxel composition spread fear, institute continuous manipulation of carriers, as well as corresponding scale span high throughput measurements. Now, let's welcome Professor Jin to start his speech. Uh, so first, I would thank uh, organizer for giving me this very nice opportunity to share our recent work with these top scientists over the world. Uh, I'm Kui Jin from IOP, uh, China Chinese Academy of Sciences. So today I'm going to talk about this series of high TC superconductors in a strange metal state. So there are key, two keywords. One is high TC superconductors. One is the strange metal state. So uh, at the beginning, since uh, there are only, allowed, uh, only five slides are allowed, so I will uh, first thank my collaborators uh, at IOP, so both uh, experts on experiment, experiments and also experts on theory. And also uh, thanks to this uh, help from the University of Maryland, also Lawrence Berkeley. And uh, the most important information I want to convey in this talk it's about the relation between this strange metal scattering with this superconducting transition temperature, uh, which published in February. So let me start to introduce you what is strange metal. So in August, so three months ago, these three gentlemen, they wrote a review summary with this title, Stranger Than Metals. So at low temperature, we know that for metal, uh, when electric light scattering dominates the transport, so the resistivity will change as a function of temperature squared. This is the temperature, this is the resistivity. But for high temperature superconductors, cuprate, we call it, for example, this lanthanum strontium copper oxide. So right, right after the discovery of high TC cuprates, people found that the resistivity is a linear temperature over a very wide range up to several hundred Kelvin down to several Kelvin or several tens of mini Kelvin. So this is the receptivity and this is temperature. If we zoom in this part, so if I apply a magnetic field to kill the superconductivity, you can see what, it, what is hidden between uh, behind the superconductive state. You can see the, this speed line, the linear in temperature receptivity can persist down to almost two, two Kelvin. So the field, magnetic field you would hear is about 48 Tesla. So this is a really challenge because 48 Tesla is really, uh, you have to do this experiment uh, in pulse magnetic field lab. So in the meantime, actually we choose another uh, system, a counterpart of lanthanum strontium copper oxide. We choose this lanthanum cerium copper oxide. So here is CE and here is SR. So when I was in Maryland, before I joined ILP, uh, this is work was done almost 10 years ago. So what we found is that this is a resistive curve in zero temperature. You can see the perfect transition here. But if you apply only seven or two eight Tesla, you can kill the superconductivity because for this compound, you only need a very low magnetic field to kill the superconductivity. So basically 10 to is enough. So if I zoom in this part, you can see that this is linearity can persist down to 20 mini Kelvin. So this actually was really means stranger in this paper. And actually we found more because this is for one doping, the serum equals 0 0.15. If we tune the serum to 0 0.16, use the magnetic field, you can also see this perfect linearity. But if you go to higher doping, where there's no spontaneity and you, know, you don't need magnetic field anymore, you can see here is T squared behavior. So basically this is a former liquid feature. So if we summarize this, this result, use this equation, we use A1 represents the slope of this three line and A2, the, uh, the coefficient of this T squared term we focus on A1. Then we can find that here, this is the doping, the serum, it means that we can, we can tune the serum from 0 0.11 to 0 0.21 with the interval about 
0 0.0 with the interval about 1%. You can see that for this A1, actually, it shows intimate link with this TC. They both increase or decrease and uh, disappears at the same doping. So this is a major finding at this, in this work. So we found the intermediate relation between A1 and the TC. So there must be something between them. So at this time, at that time, we are we asked what's the relationship between A1 and TC. Actually, this is also a very important scientific issue for this field. So during the past 10 years, what I have done. So in 2012, I joined ILP and I set up a team in ILP. So one of the tasks is that we want to pin down the relationship between these two quantities, A1 and TC. So let's look at this figure. We only have four points. So based on four points, we cannot see anything between about the relationship, okay? Because we do not have enough reliable data. And this is limited by the ability of pulse laser deposition technique. Each time we can only change the composition about 1%. So we used five years developed a technique called combinatorial rail synthesis technique. So basically now you only need two targets, one with lower doping, lower cerium, one with higher doping. So this is in a, from liquid region, this is the highest. Then you can see that we have a mask and move forward and backward. So we have two targets. We use accelerator to shoot the targets and with a mobile shuttle. And moving shot to the right direction, you will get 100% deposition here and 0% deposition here. So half period, we rotate to another target, shoot, shoot another target. And now we have a reverse deposition rate. Here, the null end is 100%, here is 0%. So just, just repeat this procedure. So we, let's say it again. We have a mobile shuttle and two targets, one with lower doping, one with higher doping. And just alternatively shooting the two targets, we will have this kind of combinator real film. And this is a real experiment in the lab. So you can see how the shuttle move and how we rotate the targets. So here, here is targets. And here is a top view of this film. So which is deposited on one centimeter substrate, this STO, strontium titanium oxide. This is the insulator, okay? And by this technique, Actually, we can got a continuous doping from 0 0.1 to 0 0.19. So now we have a continuous doping, we call it com composition spread on one substrate over one centimeter. And this is a lot of super lattice. Okay, remember this is a lot of super lattice, lattice because we have to make sure that each period, it can only deposit one unit cell or else you will get a super lattice. So that's why we spent five years in fabricating this combinator film. So it has a, uh, thin, it's, it's a thin crystalline film. And how to characterize this film? Because it has so many dopings here. So first we have to check their composition. So by WS, uh, but this analyzer had a big error bar, it's okay. But now we can, next we can do this structure characterization from millimeter in our lab to micrometer in the second source. Uh, assist by the uh, this is done in the Lord Berkeley lab. So, and we can see a clear trend because this for, from one end to another end, the last parameter changes smoothly. And after we check the composition and also the structure, then we can comfortably to marrow the receptivity, okay, the transport. Remember that along one direction, it has a continuous doping, this doping gradient from 0 0.1 to 0 0.19. But the normal direction, not direction, is uniform, right? So we only change the condition doping along one end, but the other end is uniform. And another point is that we use the insulator, insulating substrate. So we can pattern this film into many, many horror bars. Okay, actually three set of horror bars. If we have this kind of bar with a bridge of 0.01 millimeter, then what's that mean? This means that the competitive resolution is about 0.01%. So that's 100 better. This is almost two, two, 
orders of magnitude better than the conventional PLD. Okay, that means on one substrate, we grow this continuous doping film and we can then marry the receptivity from one to another. Here it shows funding state. Here is the formula liquid, okay? And we can easily get the TC, the transition temperature, and also slope of the linear temperature receptivity and plot it here. And we also have doping here, right? So we found the relation, the scaling loss, or set of scaling loss between the coefficient of this linear receptivity with the doping with TC. Okay. But I want to emphasize that the most important thing is that here, the square root of this coefficient A1 actually is linear with TC. Because, okay, this is the most important finding I want to show you. Then that means we realize a close link between paired electrons and the electron for 3D matter scattering. Okay, you can see the 3D matter scattering at higher temperature before entering into the sperm state, or you can use the magnetic field to kill spermativity and recover this linear receptivity. Anyhow, you will get this A1, and you can also extract TC and find the relation. And we found that this relation simply works also for more systems, for example, at least for lithium strontium carbon oxide. So we extracted data from Bruhan's group, Ivan Bodic group, and this system also shows this relation. And we have another work. This relation also holds for iron selenide, another high TC superconductor. But, but here, we cannot use chemical doping because chemical doping will destroy the superconductor layer. So here we use ionic liquid gating method to tune the carrier continuously. So, and you know, you see that we almost, we almost even used 10 years in fabricating the combinatory film and find the, this, this relation. But now, once we have this kind of technique, we can use this technique for our systems. And in only one year, we get the second composition spread. So this iron satellite to iron terawatt on one single substrate. So what's our goal? So we, we expected that by this combinatory technique, we may find empirical phenomena for TC, which is acting to this isotope effect. We expect we got this kind of uh, important empirical formula in future, which may play the same role in this, this like this isotope effect, this, this formula for the BCS theory for conventional spectators. So finally, we want, I want to say that we, I, we believe that we are on the road to this. And with all of this, I would thank you for your attention. I'm sorry that this disconnect. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Jing, for the one for sharing. Now it's time for the Norbert Lawrence to give about five minutes of comments on his work. Maybe I can go first. Uh, no doubt aware there's uh, one of the theory ideas is that this linear and T resistivity is connected to disorder, uh, uh, effect of disorder in systems with strong correlations. Uh, what do you think of, uh, is that, are th those kinds of ideas in consistent with your work or not? Yeah, so you're asking about what uh, the origin of this linear receptivity. Yes? Yeah. One plausible yeah. explanation is about the disorder induced so if this is disorder-induced linear receptivity, then it might mean that uh, the disorder also plays some role in electron pairing, because this relation shows that if you have larger A1, you have a larger TC. So this is a one, uh, one respect. And another, uh, for this lysine strontium carbon oxide, this system, I, I believe that uh, Professor Ivan Bodwich believe it's clean. So, so this system is, is a clean uh, D-wave superconductor, but for LCCO, the, the system I, I mirrored, I cannot see that it's clean. Okay, your so, system electron dope cooperates. Yes, it? electron dope cooperates. Uh, so we prefer spin fluctuations, this kind of quantum fluctuations that play a role in this relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but so far I don't think there is any micro mechanism to explain this. 
I mean, there is a microscopic theory recently uh, by Sachdev and, and collaborators, but it Plank. connects with disorder effect. Uh, oh, uh, there's a lot of Plank in this patient, or? Uh, it's, um, it's connected to that body of work, but mm. um, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with the ADS-CFT theory, so I don't know how to comment on that. Mm. Yeah, it's not uh, not exactly that theory, but okay. it's connected to that body of work. But it's um, oh, S SKY. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What what they're what they're claiming is that uh, you know this is an effect of disorder in strongly correlated materials, this linear and T resistivity. But yeah. uh, many many people, you're not alone in in <laughs> thinking that it's probably a clean mm. a clean system effect that's not understood yet. Yeah, yeah, but I still expect to see a uh, theory to explain why A1 larger and that result in larger TC. Okay, uh, I see raise hand, uh, Professor Wolfgang Kettler, you can raise Yeah, hand. maybe my thoughts are along similar lines. If you find such a relationship, the first question usually which comes to my mind is, is there any toy model which can explain that? Do you have any sort of Way how you would uh, argue that the resistivity sorry, should be coupled to the transition temperature. Mm. It's also a little bit, you know, on first sight strange because resistivity is dissipative and it's not clear that everything which creates more resistivity will increase the transition temperature. Yes, yes. So, so can you maybe comment on that? Uh, I'm not an expert on superconductors, so this is why I'm asking this question. Uh, first, I'm uh, I'm doing experiments, so I'm trying I'm trying to answer this question. Uh, so, uh, for cuprates or for high TC superconductors, so one thing one phenomenon is that not all their conduction carriers can condense or compel. So, actually, only a very few percent of them can form electron pairs. So this is one strange thing. So so far, I don't think any experiment can give us a precise value, how much electrons can form pair and tell us why only part of them form electron pairs. So this is my question. So based on this, I would like to say that this re relation tells me that if these electrons play a role in electron pairing, when you use temperature, when you lift up the temperature or you, use, you apply a um, high magnetic field, you kill some activity. These part of the electrons also are responsible for the displacement. Oh see? yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. I, only, I can only see this. <laughs> okay, I, I don't know whether I answered the question. <laughs> Not to some so extent hard. you did. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, Professor Gam. Uh, so my uh, similar to Alan's question. Okay, uh, this linear uh, resistance with temperature often attributed to what is called Planckian limit that it, electron electron scattering uh, yeah as you know responsible for the linear dependence does your result uh, somehow bear uh, any definitive conclusions or relevant conclusions where it is not whether it's uh, impurities or indeed uh, Planckian scattering, which is responsible for linear dependence. Okay, thank you, Professor Gang. Actually, I, I heard a talk about one decade ago in University of Maryland. Uh, I worked with Rick Green, Richard Green, when I was a postdoc. <clears throat> so, uh, for your question, so first, actually, this is uh, uh, Professor Richard Green's idea. So, he disagrees disagree with this punk dissipation. Uh, explanation because for electron doped cuprates, you can see that above this linear resistivity, actually the resistivity increased much quicker. So this this actually uh, debate from this uh, this prank dissipation or the prank limit because when you are, when you approach this limit, so suppose uh, your resistance will saturate or cannot go faster than before. So this is one reason that's why Professor Richard Green disagrees with this practice vision, at, at least in this system. So this is one, one thing. 
So in the, in the paper, actually, we proposed uh, counterfluctuations for this uh, three metal state. But so far, uh, I don't think any theory uh, explains this three metal state, state, or we call it region. Actually, in this review article, they define this three metal actually as three metal state. So, so far only a very few systems shows a three metal state, it means that you, you, you tune the doping, you find that not only one person, one, uh, not only the restrictivity one uh, shows up for different dopings, actually not restricted to one doping, that's called grid point. So I don't, I don't know that whether it's a theory that can explain, that can explain this kind of three metal state. So that's my answer, sorry. <laughs> Well, I would say there are many possible contributions yes. and uh, linear dependence is certainly strange while you can always think about deviations of linear dependence and uh, I don't know. Uh, for me, uh, Planckian uh, limit uh, theory uh, at least several years ago, it looked appealing, but I, okay, I'll leave yeah. that. So uh, one more thing is that you can see that this linear receptivity can persist down to 20 millikelvin. So Sorry. suppose if it's due to this water, if it's due to this water, so so if if this linear receptivity is due to this water, so uh, I think at very low temperature, the from liquid behavior will be recovered. I think that based on any minist theory, right? Okay. Strange, strange. Oh, strange, right. yes, strange, strange. <laughs> strange matter, strange. Yeah. Okay, uh, Professor Haruchi. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, first of all, I must say that I am not at all a specialist in uh, superconductivity or high TC superconductivity, but uh, I, I have a question for you. Uh, mm. What you are doing is is just to change. Uh, the composition of your of your sample and try to get some interesting information about the link between the resistivity versus uh, temperature and the TC uh, superconducting uh, transition temperature. And I am sure that there are a lot of people around the world who are accumulating data in this direction. So my question was, do you think that artificial intelligence science could be useful in this in this field? I know that there is a lot of uh, discussion now about using artificial intelligence accumulating a lot of data to try to find some links that the theory make it difficult to to find so i wanted to know if this is a field in which ai is being applied or not okay there are technique i used here can you help me yes so the technique actually i use here actually is the core technique in materials genome iterative this project mgi so I, I think you, you are very familiar to this uh, AI for materials, right? This is the second version. And yes. suppose that AI technique will be used for material synthesis and material characterization or material uh, even for device. So uh, I think the, the technique I, I showed here actually is the, uh, the third generation of this film, this combinatorial film technique. And uh, why we use this? Because for its cuprate, for this high TC, for this, this complex compound, so actually uh, the electron states, electronic states actually controlled by multi-parameters. So for example, when you change strontium or you change cerium, actually you also change oxygen. So you cannot control single parameter in a range or also precisely. So for this technique, we grow all this doping in exactly the same atmosphere in the same oxygen pressure. So that's why we can get this statistic rule. But for conventional method, I show you that uh, in the past few, past 10 years, actually we have a lot of data I didn't show here, but you cannot, you can find a trend, but we, we are not comfort, comfortable to show, to show you that this is a rule. But now this, I can call this is data driven, this data driven paradigm by putting this uh, material genome technique to this superconductive research. So thank you for for your thank you for your comments. So we are okay. thinking about that AI for materials. A very nice talk and Laurie's very nice comments. 
let's go to the second presenter. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, let's welcome our next presenter, Renmin Ma, who will speak to us on nano laser, laser minimization and beyond. Min Ren Ma, uh, Ren Min Ma is the tenure associate professor, School of Physics, Peking University, China. His research interests include laser physics, nanophotonics, light matter interaction, non-Hamilton, and the topological photonics. Now, let's welcome Professor Ma to start his speech. Hi everyone, this is Demi Ma. It's my great honor to be here and to discuss our research on nanolators, which is about how and why we do laser miniaturization and the inherent light matter interaction effects. We know the first laser was invented in 1960 via stimulated emission. Laser can localize the light field in frequency dimension better than any other thermal light. After about 60 years development, nowadays lasers can do this kind of field localization extremely well uh, in different dimensions, as I uh, shown here. So I highlighted one of this kind of localization, which is the localization of the light of the light field in space, which gives us small lasers and has been uh, developed as the key driver for our modern information society. Actually, the first laser invented in 1960, in 1960 can be seen as the first major step in laser miniaturization. Compared to a laser, a laser has a much shorter wavelength, about five orders of magnitude shorter, and consequently, the size of a laser can be much smaller than a laser. In 1960s, I fell off developed a semiconductor heater junction lasers, which allows us to do laser miniaturization by microfabrication techniques. Nowadays, there are two kinds of widely used small semiconductor lasers. The first one is the edge emitting laser which is with a feature size of about 100 micrometer and a corresponding power consumption of about 10 picojoule per byte. So this other one is the surface emitting laser. The size of the surface emitting laser has been miniaturized to be about 10 micrometer. And correspondingly, the power consumption is lowered to be about one picojoule per byte. For the laser miniaturization, in comes the so-called diffraction limit, which originates from the uncertainty principle of photons. Because of a diffraction limit, the shortest cavity length of a laser in any dimension is limited to be about a wavelength over two. To break this diffraction limit, in 2003, a new coherent amplifier named Spathers is proposed, which is now also known as the plasmonic nanolaser. Instead of amplifying photons in a laser, in a spacer, surface plasmons, the collective oscillation of a light coupled with a free electron are amplified, and thereby the shortest cavity length of a spacer can be as small as a few nanometer. In 2009, with a team led by Professor Xiang Zhang at UC Berkeley, we demonstrated one of the first spacer. Along all these years, we have systematically studied the fundamental properties and the applications of spacers. Here I like to highlight two works the first one is the demonstration of the scaling laws of spacers in 2017. This work clarifies that spacer has clear performance advantages over lasers when the size, the feature size is approaching or beyond the diffraction limit. The second one is the demonstration of a sodium-based uh, spacer in 2020 
This work shows the potential of a performance improvement of a spacer by material and structure optimizations. So I would like to use my last slide and a minute to share a phenomena of anomalous spontaneous emission, which we found along the research of a nanolaser. Using a simple ring radiator as an example, at a given remnant frequency, there will be two degenerate modes in the system, which is the clockwise mode and the counterclockwise mode. This is a, a case of a Hermitian degeneracy. In this ring radiator, if we introduce party time symmetric refraction index modulation, the, this system can be finely tuned to a so-called exception point, a point of a non-Hermitian degeneracy. At this non-Hermitian degeneracy exception point, because of this asymmetric coupling between the CW mode and the CW mode, there will be only one eigenstate left in the system. This is the counterclockwise mode here. Intuitively, if we think about uh, introducing a single emitter in this system, the radiation will couple to the only eigenstate of the system of this uh, counterclockwise mode, because this is uh, the only eigenstate of the system. However, surprisingly, we found that in theory and ex in experiment, when we introduce a dark, double emitter, a single emitter in this uh, a system at an exception point. The radiation field can couple to this uh, clockwise mode, which is the missing dimension in this uh, uh, system of exception point. So this work shows that the radiation field of a single emitter can be fully decoupled from its environment eigenstate. With that, I would like to conclude my talk and thank you very much for your attention. Very uh, nice talk. So uh, please, Lawrence, comments on his work. Yeah, maybe let me ask a question. I mean, I was intrigued by your last comment about this anomalous spontaneous emission. So does it mean that your laser has also some special properties in, I don't know, the threshold behavior or the physics of the amplification? Or is the figure of merit really just the miniaturization to make it smaller? Okay, thank you for your comment. So um, this is a particular question for this last part or the, the, the former part. Yeah, uh, or in general, if the laser you have, the lasers you have developed, what is their distinguishing feature? You said they are small, mm -hmm. miniaturized, but is uh -huh. there also something special about I don't know, the threshold behavior, the nature of the photon field or? Yeah, okay, sure. So um, from uh, that point of view, so when you make a, a laser way smaller or closer to the diffraction limit, so from the threshold point of view, so firstly, the threshold the power consumption will be lowered because the physical volume of the gain media you need is much smaller. So the power consumption kind of is equaling to how much uh, the electrons you need to uh, pump up to the excited uh, level. Uh, the gain volume is smaller, that means you need uh, less uh, this excited electrons. So this is the first point of the threshold uh, uh, lowering. So also the threshold behavior will look a little bit different than anomalies. Anomalies that you will see a kink, like a uh, spontaneous emission and then uh, yeah a kink or two laser emission. So for a small laser, you will see um, almost a, a linear line like uh, from spontaneous emission to, stimu to stimulation, the, 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 um, sorry, the, um, the, the slope is, uh, 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 is a constant. So there will be no, no kink over there. But uh, for the second order coherence, you still can see, uh, I mean, the okay. kink is also, um, uh, yeah. I noticed Gam, Professor Gam is raising his hand. Uh, it's your turn to. All right, it's a very nice cartoon, but what I, what is missing? You said that there is an experiment about this. Do I understand correctly? You are talking about single uh, uh, photon emitters coupled to 
kind of plasmonic cavity or what kind of experimental systems are you talking about? Yes, yeah, thank you very much for your question. Yeah, because only five slides are allowed, so I didn't show the experiment uh, here. So uh, actually, uh, initially, we like it exactly to demonstrate what you uh, said. So we want to insert a single quantum emitter in a uh, plasmonic cavity and see this uh, cover reversing uh, this anomalous uh, spontaneous emission fact uh, with a beta fit factor equaling to one. But actually, that's very challenging. We spend uh, uh, almost uh, five to four to five years. Uh, we're still on, uh, on the way to realize that. But actually, in the experiment, we, we first demonstrated a uh, Merkel wave version and the acoustic version, actually. That, uh, we did the Merkel wave version, and uh, one of my collaborator, collaborator demonstrated the uh, acoustic version. So the experiment is demonstrated in Merkel wave regime. So the cavity is um, kind of a uh, 10 centimeter large. So it's very easy to fabricate this cavity uh, with this uh, refracting dice modulation. Yes, thank you. So we are still on the way to demonstrate the, the plasmonic version with the quantum emitter. Okay, understood. Thank you. Professor Harochi, uh, it's your turn. Yes, uh, when, when, when you speak about very small cavities, which are smaller than lambda cube and, uh, and uh, high Q cavities, immediately what comes in mind is the application to cavity quantum electrodynamics. So um, I think my question is related to the previous one. Can you? Tell us a little bit about the kind of experiments that you would like to do with this system uh, in basic science and in possibly in application, application to practical devices. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the comment. Yes, so um, I think it, it, this is not only about the size miniaturization. The size miniaturization only gives us a tour to explore more uh, physics and application uh, opportunities. So as I uh, mentioned, like if you make a size small, first the thing is the power consumption become lower. That can help yeah. us to uh, solve this kind of a communication, this data communication uh, power consumption problem. So also uh, because it's very small, you can have a very strong field. Uh, yes. So you can enhance light matter inter interaction for sensing and detecting that kind of application. Actually, we demonstrated within this uh, uh, very small plasmonic nano laser, we can detect uh, uh, explosive molecular uh, beyond the one part per billion this kind of uh, uh, concentration. Um, also, uh, because the cavity is very small, there is only a few eigen mode of the photon uh, eigen mode inside the cavity. So you can do eigen mode engineering like uh, we I showed in the last slides. Also, uh, it's very interesting. Like uh, let's say uh, we also working on this twisted lattice. So uh, in photonics. And we show that uh, the quality factor over mode volume in this twist lattice can be much higher than any exist, uh, uh, existing photonic cavity, uh, even higher than uh, visible gearing mode cavity. Of course, I mean, this is uh, by our simulation. Uh, we are working on that uh, experimentally. We show like uh, even in a uh, nano cavity, I mean, with all dimension close to uh, nominal over two, the experimental, uh, we experimentally got the um, quality factor over one million. So uh, that means probably we can do more quantum dynamics, uh, uh, like uh, seeing like uh, elect quantum electron dynamics thing uh, in this kind of nano cavity. Thank you. So you, uh, you were talking about the work in the Zhang lab over the years on spacers. I wonder if you could briefly summarize um, where we are in terms of using them in technology and whether the uh, you know, uh, using different materials like sodium is, uh, is, um, provides a route to applications. Okay, thank you for the question. Yes, so um, I think it's, uh, since the first demonstration of the Spazer experiment is already uh, 16 years past, so um, I think we are, um, in terms of application, I think uh, uh, there's still uh, technical challenges like uh, especially like uh, for optical interconnects, like uh, this kind of thing to use this small laser to lower the power consumption. So uh, one of the key technical challenge is the electrical driven of these small guys. Because it's so small, like uh, we need to arrange everything like a doping and uh, motor confinement and uh, to remove the uh, parasitic losses uh, and, and so on. So that, uh, but working, we are working on that 
uh, to make uh, like kind of electric driven version of this uh, little guy. So we are working on that, but uh, I think uh, still uh, like uh, challenges over there. Okay, but, uh, thanks very much. But other applications, so, uh, I would like to end, end a few more uh, sentences for that question. So um, for other applications, like for sensing and imaging, so for that application, for these applications, we do not need electric driven, so that uh, save a lot of things. So I think that probably prob that kind of applications probably may come uh, may may come soon. Okay, so um, let me uh, uh, have a uh, selfish follow up. Uh, uh, the does the review that you uh, have there from Nanophotonics does that cover the uh, your current thinking on electrical driven versions of of spacers? Oh, yes, indeed. Yes. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and now, please, uh, thank you for Professor uh, Ma's nice speech. Now, please let me uh, give a speech. I'm He Tian, a deputy director and associate professor, Institute of Integrated Circuits, uh, School of Integrated Circuits in Tsinghua University, China. I have been researching various devices based on two-dimensional materials. And now I will start my uh, speech. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm He Tian from Tsinghua University. My topic is 2D material-based scanning transistors and uh, intelligent devices. I will mainly focus on my recent work for the sub-1 nanometer gate length transistors and the mixed mode artificial throat. As all of you know, the successful development of silicon, we have a silicon wafer in 1947 we have the first bipolar transistor, followed by the development of integrated circuits two years later. In 1971, Intel developed the first four-bit CPU and later the transistor number and performance doubled every two years. It is called Morse law. As the pioneer work from the AK Gam and his colleague, we have graphene and many other two-dimensional materials. Now we have a two-dimensional material-based transistors and small-scale circuits. More interestingly, I found the 2D material also follows the Morse law and name it the Morse law of 2D materials. The current record is 10 to the fourth power. I have a project this year related to it. I would like to push it to the 10 to the sixth power, which is also follows the expedition. My research interest is very related to the artificial two-dimensional devices. I would like to make two-dimensional based transistors as memories to build up, build up a human brain. And also we have body sensors. So I also make two-dimensional based sensors and actuators. For part one, I would like to introduce my uh, representative work, sub one nanometer gate length MOS2 transistors. As I mentioned in previously slides, Silicon transistor is scaling down with the shorter gate length. The gate length scaling down is the core parameters for the Morse law. As you can see in the past 75 years, the gate length uh, becomes smaller and smaller, but based on the Heisenberg relations, it cannot be too small. For silicon, the gate length is, can be down to three to four nanometers is the end of silicon. But for two dimensional materials that, like MS2, it has larger effective mass and the band gap, so the gate length limitation can be down to sub one nanometer. Here is the uh, previously records using the MS2 combination with single wall carbon nanotube. The carbon nanotube getting the MS2 channel, since the diameter of the CNT is just one nanometer, so the physical gate length of this transistor is just one nanometer. Uh, this work is published by Stanford and the Berkeley team at Science uh, 2016. When I noticed this work, my first idea is using graphene as gate because the thinnest gate material we can use in the Earth is graphene. But graphene is not a is a planar material. In order to effective gate the channel, we make a vertical MS2 channel and the additional aluminum field to screen the electric field from the surface of graphene. And only the edge graphene can control the MS2. And moreover, at 0VG, the MS2 channel should be initially unstated. 
the graphene edge controls partially MS2 to high resistance states. So the whole channel is closed. This is a crazy idea. So we take three years to make this device working, use 19 step IC process and six steps lithography. The transistor performance is not bad. The sub threshold swing is down to 117 mini volt per decade. And the off ratio is larger than 10 to the fifth power. The gate length is scaling down below one nanometer, which is a new record compared to all the previously transistors. Uh, the reason the Nature Materials uh, real paper uh, also highlight our work, and uh, it highlights the two dimensional devices and the integration towards the silicon line. For the second part, I would like to introduce the artificial throat and the artificial eardrum. In 1999, uh, Shinda from Japan developed a very interesting sound source using the aluminum film. It can emit sound without uh, vibration. It just relies on the thermal acoustic e effect. The 30 nanometer aluminum film can heat up the air and makes the air molecule to produce sounds. As you can see, the produced sound has an inverse relation with the thickness, so the thinner conducting materials can produce larger sound. The graphene is the thinnest material in the world. Around 12 years ago, nobody used graphene to produce sound, so I did it. I enabled both multi-layer graphene and a single-layer graphene sound source, and I found the thinner graphene can have produce a larger sound. And we make the graphene earphone, uh, which can connect to our laptop and the cell phone to listen new music. The sound frequency not only cover our human beings, but it can also cover ultrasound range. So I let a dog wear our graphene earphone and can, can be controlled. Graphene can not only produce sound, it can also detect sound based on piezo resistivity effect. So in, 97, uh, in 2017, we make the first artificial throat to help the mouth people to speak. We integrate the sound emission and detection in one device. And later, we make the artificial eardrum based on the maxine with microstructure because the maxine has larger interlayer distance compared to graphene. And by combining the microstructure, we can enable two-stage amplification with very sensitive uh, pressure sensing down to 0.1 Pascal. Moreover, we build the largest database for graphene artist's throat with very high voice, voice recognition rate. The basic detection sound frequency is lower than the microphone, so the mechanical movements of the throat can be detected. Let us see some video. The first video is a dog wearing the graphene earphone. So uh, there is uh, no signal and the uh, apply sing uh, signals and the dog can uh, stand up. So it can very uh, efficiently not only service the human beings, but also uh, animals. Let's see the uh, second video is uh, my students using graphene artificial throat to, to play a game, the ritual snake. Uh, so his movements of the throat uh, can be detected and uh, it can control the snake to, uh, to move. And the third part is our graphene artificial throat. Uh, we will show the uh, fabrication uh, process, uh, signal detection, and the uh, recognition uh, process. So we use the laser scribing uh, technology so it can fabricate the graphene a larger scale uh, with a uh, low cost. And we fabricate two layers. The one layer is the voice recognition layer. The second layer is a pre preceptor layer. And these two layers can combine together to uh, uh, form our uh, double layer artificial throat. Graphene. Uh, so there is a speaking graphene and there graphene. Is, uh, is already some uh, signal uh, detection. And uh, it can not only detect the mechanical uh, movement, but also can detect the sound. Uh, so this has dual modes. Uh, so based on the uh, sound spectrum, so we can notice the uh, the basic frequency is lower than the sound. <clears throat> Sleep. Sleep. So you cannot, you can also Sorry. be uh, recognized Sleep. by our machine. So the non-sleep three 
and this can be recognized. And the final part, due to the time limitation, I have to finalize my talk. Uh, I would like to thank to the supporter of our team leader, Professor Tian Li Ren, and also many important uh, collaborators. Uh, if you're interested in our work, you can read these publications. I have one collaboration uh, paper uh, with Nobel laureate Professor uh, Zewer. I visited his lab and I really I witnessed how good the top scientists can be. Now I'm doing very interesting ongoing projects with my colleagues. For example, the dark matter interaction uh, detection. So I'm trying to make very sensitive and the broad range for the detection for this project. And also uh, we are trying to make uh, artificial robot fish. We're trying to put our flexible sensors into this machine. And finally, we are building a brain-like network to reach the scale of a human beings. So our brain scale is around three or four orders higher than the current chip. So in order to bridge this gap, uh, we are trying to use the nanoware to build the, uh, the, the AI block. And the thanks uh, for your attention. And uh, 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 Lawrence, uh, please uh, raise your uh, questions on me. My raised hand was actually left over from last time, but I can go first. Um, okay. So I'm uh, curious about your silver nanowire network for, I guess, uh, building computing devices for artificial intelligence, I guess. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, this is uh, our ongoing project because currently the chip, the scale cannot uh, uh, reach our human brain. So we are thinking about an, our uh, silver nanowire. Uh, because there is a PVA layer between the nanoware. So there is some uh, resistive switching behaviors. So using this uh, resistive switching behavior like the memory resistor, so we can build up the snaps and the neuron and using the artificial snaps and the neuron, so we can build up the uh, brain functions. So what we want to do is like to first uh, reach the density of the human brain. And then we build up the artificial snaps and the neuron. And then we build out an algorithm like SDDP or a winner take all algorithm. And finally, we can make this machine uh, working uh, like our human brain. Uh, we can learn, uh, we can forget something, uh, we can like something, uh, think, uh, like a thinking machine. Yeah. But this so is this not, is a, yeah. Uh, this is a different strategy than, I guess, uh, you know. Um, uh, current deep learning, which is uh, uh, using maybe brain-like architectures, but uh, you know, very uh, and silicon hardware. Yeah, um, yeah, we are trying to build a e-brain, so it's like an electronic brain. Yeah, uh, uh, but we are also noticed uh, uh, using some uh, bio cell. Yeah, it can also have some uh, behaviors. So maybe we can also use some uh, bio organs to uh, build up this. Uh, functions. Uh, Professor Gam? Right. Uh, I have quite a few questions, but let me be quick uh, with two. Uh, uh, concerning your very short transistor work, it's not only the length of the gate, but also contact resistance, uh, capacitance, and all those things which uh, determine the performance. Uh, how how about uh, say frequency rather than uh, only frequency of uh, your switching for this kind of uh, graphene molybdenum disulfide transistor? Okay, very good question. Yeah, so it's about uh, the dynamic uh, uh, performance of this transistor, right? Uh, yeah, so. Uh, as often you know that the mobility of MS2 is not that high. So in our work, we uh, use the CVD MS2 to build up a large scale circuits, but the mobility is around like uh, uh, five to 10. So it's not, not that high. Um, uh, so for the dynamic performance, I think maybe it will be uh, limited by the mobility of the MS2. Uh, so uh, uh, there is still a great need that we need to push the high quality, like a single crystal MS2 with higher mobility, and we may be push the uh, dynamic performance 
But I think the main uh, application uh, direction of this device is for 2D materials, the no power electronics. So for the no power electronics, maybe we don't care about uh, uh, too fast, like a gigahertz. Maybe we can work at a kilohertz. I think uh, uh, it should be fine for current our uh, device. But if we want to push to the gigahertz, uh, we should to improve the mobility uh, with uh, much more efforts, I think. Okay, this part I understand, yeah. Okay. Uh, Professor uh, Kendler. Yeah, since I work on quantum science, I'm interested if in the small dimensions of your transistor, if you're now approaching also a situation where quantum effects would become important. For instance, you know, in a small confinement, yeah, I would assume quantum states of the electrons are discretized. You no longer have a full continuum. And maybe when do you get into corrections of you know the classical behavior uh, of a transistor uh, so you mean uh, there are maybe not a cal uh, classical behaviors and there should be some yeah but so is, uh, is there some is, are there certain things related because you're really pushing against heisenberg's uncertainty or is there some effect due to the if you have two quantum levels there's a beat node between the two and something like this. So are there any, are you approaching or maybe already seeing certain quantum effects in your small device? Uh, yes, so uh, yeah. So the basically uh, idea is that we use the, the point of graphene to turn off the MS2. So uh, the electric field can be, you know, actually spread out. So actually the physical uh, gate length is just the one atomic uh, thickness. But uh, due to uh, based on our simulation, the effective uh, off states gate length is around uh, four uh, nanometers. And uh, since our measurements is at the root temperature, so I think if we want to see more quantum behaviors, it's much uh, easier to cooling down this uh, device to like more a lower uh, temperature and. Uh, I think we have a chance to see some uh, quantum behaviors. And at root temperature, I think the most possibility uh, behavior is like the tunneling behaviors we can see at root temperature. But if we want to see other uh, behaviors, we should to cool, cooling down the temperature. So I think uh, uh, we, uh, this is a very good uh, suggestion. I think uh, uh, we can try to uh, lower down the temperature to see uh, if based on this device, uh, we can see some uh, new phenomena, yeah. Uh, this is a good uh, suggestion. Can you elaborate a little bit on the, the way you could use this kind of device for dark matter detection? What 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 do you have in mind? And uh, you mean the uh, the dark matter uh, detection, yes. right? Yes, I, I was intrigued by this. Uh, yeah, yeah. Detection. So uh, yeah, so this is a very uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, project here. So uh, the, my friends uh, says uh, if uh, anyone can find them. Dark matter, yeah, they deserve a Nobel Prize. So uh, uh, currently nobody find the dark matter. So what they uh, want to do is using the uh, the uh, the XC liquids. So they think the dark matter can have uh, some interaction with the XC liquids. And uh, after the interaction, there are some uh, photo emission. The photo emission, the wavelength is uh, in the ultraviolet and also in the IR, near IR region. So uh, what they do is doing some photo detector here with very high, very high sensitivity, with a very high gain. So uh, it can even single uh, photon emission, uh, it can be detected. Uh, so they want me to fabricate a very uh, high gain uh, photo detector. So if there is some uh, interaction happen, the dark matter with the, 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 the liquid and uh, there are some uh, signal come out and we can uh, maybe conclude that uh, uh, there is something happen with the uh, dark matter. Yeah, so uh, uh, currently we are trying to make this, uh, uh, they are trying to make this in the very deep uh, earth, not in our ground. So it's uh, because they have very uh, less uh, radiation. Uh, I think this is not uh, uh, easy, but uh, yeah, it's uh, like a long-term uh, project, yeah but we want to uh, try to do it. 
Uh, thanks. What, what for, kind of photo detectors are you using for the dark the dark matter detection? Uh, the currently uh, they need a very uh, high gain photo detector. Uh, so they are using the the avalanche effects because avalanche effects, uh, the PN junction avalanche, they can have a, a, a just the one uh, photo detect uh, photo uh, emission. They can be a lot of uh, current generation. So uh, they use, but this is very expensive. So uh, just the one uh, detector is uh, several thousand dollars. So uh, for this uh, container, it will requires like a thousand uh, detectors. So it's have a, if you're a billionaire, you can uh, make this uh, like a experiment. So it consume a lot of money. Yeah. The first part of our section has finished. Now let's begin the second part. Ever Q young scientist in turn, uh, please, uh, Professor Jin, to ask questions. Uh, thanks for the comments, and uh, I would like to raise a question. So, uh, in our field, uh, we know that at least there are two very challenging issues. One is the mechanism of high TC superconductivity, and another one, the other one, is how to find room temperature superconductor, I mean, uh, ambient pressure. So for young scientists, so do you have any advice for us to the road to these two questions? <laughs> okay, that's my, that's my question. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, each professor can give some suggestions. Let, uh, let's start with uh, Kettler. Uh, Professor Keller, you can go ahead. You're asking a good question. High temperature superconductor with room temperature superconductors. I guess most people agree that it's possible, but it may not be possible. We don't know yet whether this is possible. And maybe in fundamental science, we would say, unless somebody has shown that it is impossible, we have to try to find it. Okay. So in that sense, it is... Uh, an open question and like in fundamental science you're looking for something which may never exist so it may be you may spend half of your life trying to develop something and the result in the end would be negative but that's the only way how science can make progress that many people search for something and some people find something other don't but that's what sort of means to uh, deal with the unknowns in nature. So in that sense, I would kind of say, yes, I go for it, search for it. We need the best young people to look for it and there is a chance that they will find it. But at the same time, I would also say, and I mean, that's how I also looked at my search for Bose-Einstein condensation. I said, okay, but even if it does not happen, even if it is not possible to reach it, if you set yourself an important goal, it will motivate you to do good science. So in other words, if you pursue the room temperature superconductor, even if you never reach it, you will do a lot of really good research. And maybe your research is better because when you focus on a big goal like the high TC, like the room temperature superconductor, as if you would just explore materials in general. So set yourself a goal, be aware that the goal may never be achievable, but the goal will motivate you to be the best scientist you can be. Thank you for encouraging. Thank you. Okay, uh, Professor Haruchi, uh, it's your turn. I wanted to say something along the same line as, as Borgon Ketterli. Uh, I am not so young anymore, and I remember that people have started talking about high TC superconductivity back in the 80, 1980s, 85 or 86. At that time, uh, uh, magazines like Time or Newsweek were having big articles, 10 page long articles saying all the fantastic things which will become possible with high TC superconductivity. And now we are 40 years later, and this uh, the question is still open. Uh, uh, I agree that the, if you if you just go try to do this kind of research, you have first to understand that it, it is before being uh, apl an applied field. It's a field in basic science. There is a lot of fundamental basic effects 
in condensed matter physics, which uh, are not understood and which uh, should be understood in order to get to applications. Uh, one, maybe one line of research I heard about that would be to uh, use quantum simulators, that is to try to emulate what happens in real matter with cold atoms or, or with arrays of atoms prepared in well-defined states, which can emulate the kind of structure you have in 2D or in 3D materials. This is a field which is developing very fast. I don't know if you have uh, many uh, groups in China doing that, but uh, one, at least one of the goals which is uh, put forward in this kind of uh, research is precisely to synthesize, to be able to have clues to synthesize new materials among which superconducti high TC superconductivity is one which is very often quoted. But again, there is no, no certainty of success in, the, in this kind of research. In the way, if you do this kind of simulation, even if you don't find high TC superconductivity, you might find some interesting phases of matter which can be useful and which can be surprising. Any comments, Professor Kemp or McDonough? I can say something, you know, I'm, I'm confident. Uh, uh, it's very reasonable to believe that there, uh, there are high temperature, there are ambient pressure room temperature superconductors. If you can get more than half of the way uh, from absolute zero to uh, room temperature, it seems unlikely that there isn't, uh, it isn't possible to get all the way. So, uh, you know, um, I guess uh, it's uh, one of the things that's maybe impressive is how difficult it is to understand superconductivity to, uh, from a, uh, even though the superconducting state is rather simple and very well understood, it seems, uh, you know, understanding what the recipe is to uh, make electrons pair is, uh, has been um, still really uh, beyond what people um, can do with any confidence. So I think quantum simulation is a good idea. And I would like to bring up, you know, the possibility, a new new way of doing quantum simulations, which is with Moray materials, which has, you know, both advantages and disadvantages relative to uh, cold atom quantum simulation. Uh, but it is true that nowadays uh, people can make Hubbard models um, in Moray materials, make Hubbard model systems. Uh, and indeed, they uh, so far, most of the experiments have been done with triangular lattice Hubbard model uh, materials. And uh, I think we can say that uh, they're not very high temperature superconductors, or at least no superconductivity has been seen yet. Uh, very soon, people will be uh, doing experiments with um, with uh, honeycomb lattice, uh, more 2D moray materials. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, incidentally, I guess one part of the recipe we, we already have a hint at is that uh, 2D seems to be favorable for high temperature superconductivity. But... Um, uh, we will, you know, we will know whether Hubbard model or honeycomb lattice uh, uh, systems are uh, are superconductors or not, and uh, uh, th those should be very similar to um, square lattice uh, Hubbard model systems uh, like the cuprates. Uh, so I, I think it's possible to uh, learn some lessons from from. Uh, experiments both in cold atoms and moray systems and maybe other types of quantum simulations that will come along uh, and uh, and um, you know I'll, I'll let that be a guide to um, searching for real materials that can host ambient pressure room temperature superconductivity <laughs> i'm sure it's going to come uh, i hope it comes in my lifetime and uh, there's a better chance maybe it comes in your lifetime Okay, we are hot. Hotter. <laughs> okay. 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 Right. Uh, Professor Gam, it's your turn. Uh, yeah. Uh, this question reminds me. Question. Uh, people ask me. Uh, 
for many years what I would like to do. And I always have the, in terms of research, and I always reply, I would like to discover room temperature superconductivity and cold nuclear fusion. So those two <laughs> big moments which I like. Uh, this came to the extent when it's uh, uh, in 2012, uh, we published a rather popular review on Van der Waals material, some of you know, uh, somewhere there, there is a suggestion how to make uh, uh, room temperature superconductors, of course, a little bit teasing. So you need to take uh, BISCO or IPCO, disassemble it into two-dimensional planes, and then assemble them in a kind of intelligent manner in a better material. What better material means, uh, uh, well, it's another question, but to some extent, okay, people did try to do this, and it seems to be generally not very stupid idea to disassemble high TC and a little bit maybe put intermediate planes uh, maybe a little bit twist them and so on, but it's too hard. But uh, Alan referred to uh, in his uh, comment is uh, what he has done uh, theoretically and some other people have done experimentally. Instead of disassembling high TC, they disassemble graphite and put it in intelligent manner with very precise angle, which is called magic angle, which is 105 degree, which Alan actually predicted to do. And voila, we have a, we have a, a room temperature superconductor, but your temperature has to be very cold, around 2-4 Kelvin. Uh, that's another way of achieving uh, room temperature superconductivity make your room very cold. Metamaterial, thank you. Please, Professor Ma, to ask the questions. So I would like to take this opportunity to ask a, a technical question that puzzled me uh, for a long time, actually. So, so we know spontaneous emission is triggered by zero point energy. Uh, according to Einstein relationship on um, A and B coefficients, spontaneous emission rate uh, is equaling to actually one real photon triggered uh, stimulated emission. So th this is uh, hard for me to understand why the vacuum that kind of so powerful is, can be as a real photon to trigger something. Uh, I, I don't know whether uh, you can have some comments on that. Thank you very much. It would be nice if, if someone would repeat the question or I, I couldn't get a clue except for zero energy and Einstein emission, spontaneous emission. Can you? Yeah. Okay, so let me repeat my question. So, um, so we know like uh, the spontaneous emission is triggered by uh, zero point energy of the vacuum. Um, that's why we have spontaneous emission. But according to Einstein's relationship on this kind of a spontaneous emission rate related to stimulated emission rate, so if we do some calculation, we will get we will get this conclusion that this kind of a zero point energy of the vacuum triggered spontaneous emission rate emission rate is equaling to one real photon triggered stimulated emission rate stimulated emission rate. So why I I, I just wondering why uh, this vacuum is so powerful it can act uh, as a real photon to trigger a transition. Uh, for spontaneous emission? It started, I'm sure, Serge, you can really chip in here, but let me maybe sort out certain things. Uh, the zero point energy is one half h bar omega. Right. So the total energy is n plus one half h bar omega, but the total emission is n plus one. So there is a question of the factor of two, whether spontaneous emission just comes from zero point fluctuations of the field or not. And I know Claude Contanucci has written wonderful papers about analyzing which part of the fluctuating uh, component, whether it's a radiation reaction force or whether it's vacuum fluctuation causes it. But nevertheless, 
I'm not, I'm not sure if your question is about this factor of two or factor of one half, but you also asked the general peer picture, why is the vacuum so strong? Uh, yes, I think so, the yeah, one, yes, this is one or two also is uh, kind of, I also, uh, yeah, I, that's a factor of two, yes, uh, because of the half photon of the zero point energy, that also uh, kind of uh, appalls me of that factor of two, but uh, uh, in general, I just, uh, so, I, so for the factor of two, either search has a wonderful explanation, but I know there is a nice paper from Claude Kohn-Tanuji where he really talks about it and says there is, I think there is vacuum fluctuation and there is radiated right. reaction. For the ground right. state, they subtract. That's why the ground state is stable. But for the excited state, they add up and one half plus one half gives one. So right. there is a simple explanation like that. But in order, but when you say it, uh, why is the vacuum so powerful? <laughs> the electric field in the vacuum is comparable to the field of a single photon. So the electric field, the vacuum here, it has an electric field, which has a physical effect. And the electrical field of the vacuum corresponds roughly to the electric field of a photon. But this is similar to the harmonic oscillator. If you're in the harmonic oscillator ground state, the kinetic energy, the zero point motion of the kinetic energy is one half of the zero point motion uh, of the kinetic energy you have to add to, the, to go to the next and to the next energy level. So yeah. it's a real physical effect. There is kinetic energy, electric energy. There are things related I mean, that's, that's um, you can say the mystery of the vacuum. The vacuum is not empty. The vacuum is filled by fluctuating fields. Yeah, in fact, uh, can, I, can I make okay. a comment? Okay, Professor Harashi, it's your time. Uh, first of all, uh, Wolfgang had it uh, right. In fact, uh, one of the big puzzles is to understand within quantum electrodynamics why the ground state is stable and the excited state is uh, subjected to spontaneous emission. And uh, Claude Cohen Tanuji uh, uh, wrote a, a very nice article in which he shows that there are indeed two effects. One is the effect of uh, the stimulated, so to speak, by the vacuum fluctuation, and the other is radiation reaction. And the two effects cancel each other for ground states, and they add each other for the excited state. Now, also, uh, I think uh, the fact that you have an electric field fluctuation in the vacuum is just a consequence of Heisenberg and sort of derelation. It's true. As, so, as soon as you under, uh, accept the idea that the mode of the electromagnetic field is an oscillator, then you cannot escape from the fact that you have these kind of fluctuations and they act on single atoms, but they also act on macroscopic system. In fact, the Casimir force, which uh, is the attraction between two metallic plates can be understood in terms of radiation pressure due to the vacuum fluctuation existing between the plates. And this was discovered by Casimir back in the 1940s and, and it's one of the first ma macroscopic evidence of, of uh, quantum electrodynamics and so, so it, it's well understood now the mystery about the vacuum is what happens beyond the electromagnetic forces the fact that you have the vacuum is also full of all kind of virtual particles which are not photons and uh, and this uh, i cannot comment too much about that but this is a big big question in, in uh, modern cosmology what is the vacuum really about and what is the role of the vacuum for example, in the uh, expansion of the universe. In the, and uh, this is one of the big, big fundamental issues that uh, which is not solved yet. Okay, thank you very much for your comment. Okay, uh, Professor Gam or McDonald, is there any comments on these questions? Well, I guess, you know, I, I can say maybe from a condensed matter physics point of view, uh, uh, we're uh, very accustomed to having uh, quantum ground states, vacuums, if you like, that are extremely complicated. Uh, and uh, for example, the ground state or vacuum state of 2D electrons in a magnetic field uh, is um, uh, very unusual and uh, hosts uh, changes the quasi particles that emerge from it to have fractional charge and statistics. So I think it's really, uh, you know, um, 
maybe what's special about light is that its quantum state is, uh, including its quantum ground state, is is rather simple. As uh, as Professor Arosh uh, said, our our vacuum is is not just a vacuum of the electromagnetic field, but many other virtual particles. So, uh, yeah, it's a. Uh, I think your question is a, a philosophical question in a way. <laughs> Yeah, I kind of. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Professor Gam, uh, it's your time. Yeah, I I have nothing clever to add to this conversation, but as Sal Alan said, that in condensed matter, you regularly deal with uh, zero ground state and not only, well, not only condensed matter, um, um, chemistry as well, ground state are quite known. So, what? Uh, uh, your question uh, has inspired a question from myself. If you have two systems nearby with uh, twice different energies, whether the system in ground state can cause stimulating emission in the system with twice smaller ground state between those states. My gut feeling it wouldn't happen, but I really don't know. And this, this is possible probably to achieve uh, using cold atoms or just atoms, uh, just twice different energy and see influence of ground state on one state on, on emission in the other system. I would rather say when you have a combined system, look at it as one system. And if this one system in the ground state, it will be stable. But if you bring two systems together of different energies, and, the, and you, if you bring them together in a non-adiabatic way, <laughs> you could possibly wind up in an excited state. But I think the rule is really when you assemble something, when you have combinations of it, if you are in the overall ground state of the combined system, then I would say the arguments of Claude Contanucci tell us that there is no possibility of spontaneous emission out of this system. Yeah, that's a look at it, but I just can't know. I don't know the answer from the back of my head, yeah. But I wanted to maybe raise a question, which maybe we can also have discussions among ourselves, I think, namely a search. Uh, there are some papers who say the Casimir force can be also explained, not just by the vacuum fluctuation, but you can also explain it by having just fluctuating dipoles in yes. the materials of the wall. So therefore, yes. I, I don't know, when I talk to people about, hey, the vacuum is filled with electric field, the vacuum is not empty, that's one description. But we don't have a, I, I'm not sure do, whether we really have a proof of it, because all the phenomena like, you know, Casimir force can also be explained by fluctuations in the material. Yeah. Uh, I, I... I understand what you mean, but I think it means that you, you cannot make a consistent theory if you don't admit that the fluctuations exist both in the in the electrons in the material and in in the in the vacuum field between the plates. You cannot make a consistent theory which deals classically with one part of the system and quantum mechanically with the other. So I think for consistency, the, the two pictures are equivalent and cannot separate them. I, I, this this discussion brings make me think about another point. I think now there is a field in chemistry, which is uh, being developed in particular by my uh, colleague in, in Strasbourg, Professor Ebesen, in which he has shown that chemical reaction can be modified if they occur in small cavities in which the vacuum has different properties than in free space. So there is a a field of chemistry now which can try to to make use of these properties of the vacuum to to direct chemical reaction in one way or the other i think it's very intriguing it's still uh, maybe a little bit controversial but this is a field which is developing and with, in which there is a lot maybe a lot of hope that interesting things will happen Yeah, you know, maybe I can add to that. You know, um, I think uh, really flowing from Professor Everson's work 
there's a lot of interest now in solid state materials about whether or not you can control the properties of solid state materials. Uh, you know, uh, the, uh, particularly uh, our favorite mysterious one, superconductivity, simply by uh, by controlling the vacuum. Um, it's interesting. I, I want to make uh, you know another perspective on this on the Casimir force and and quantum vacuums and so on. Uh, as you know, the non-relativistic limit of the Casimir force is van der Waals interactions, and uh, van der Waals interactions, uh, 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 you know, in non-relativistic quantum theory of matter, uh, uh, these are just um, uh, correlation effects, correlations actually between fluctuating dipoles, as uh, as Wolfgang said, and uh, so. Uh, in that theory, which, you know, uh, in the non-relativistic limit, we can ignore the fact that it's actually photons uh, communicating between different pieces of matter, and we have an instantaneous uh, Coulomb interaction, which creates quantum correlations between distant materials, and, and um, so that's an interesting perspective, this non-relativistic perspective on the, on the nature of the quantum uh, vacuum and how it gives rise to uh, Van der Waals forces and uh, with relativistic corrections to Casimir. May I make a comment on that? I think there is a very interesting development about the Van der Waals forces now, is that the fact that you can observe them between very excited between Rydberg atoms, which are essentially huge atoms, and whereas two ordinary atoms interact at one nanometer distance or less, these atoms interact at 10 micrometer from each other. So it's really macroscopic Van der Waals forces, which occur at distances which are huge at the atomic scale. And you can prepare artificial structure in which Rydberg atoms are located 10, 15 microns away from each other. So you make a, a, a sample of artificial matter in which the interatomic distances are huge and quantum effects are very visible. So it's a very interesting development. For the time being, they are not retarded forces, but uh, you, you could also come into the regime where these atoms would interact at uh, millimeter distances with a retarded part of the Van der Waals interaction. Uh, let me ask one question. Yeah, uh, previously two questions is a very uh, technical question. And I have a general question. Uh, I have a dream uh, to be a top scientist when I was a child. So I have a question related to the research topic selection. In order to make a groundbreaking research, so how to choose the research topic? Yeah, this is a general question, but uh, I think uh, it's very important uh, yeah, for me, yeah. So I want to listen to the four Loris to give me some yeah, suggestions. Professor Keller? My answer may not be fully satisfying to you, but there is a big element. You have to be lucky to be at the right place at the right time. Okay. And I can mention that why did I have a chance to discover Bose-Einstein condensation? Well, I was a postdoc in Germany. I was working with molecules in chemistry, and I just wanted to do something which is more fundamental. So I looked around, what are the fields where excitement happened? And in my kind of area of knowledge, atoms, molecules, optics, lasers, it was cold atoms. So people had just laser-cooled atoms, so I made a good choice. I went into an exciting frontier. But I have to be honest and say at that moment in, 19, in 1990, when I joined the field, I thought, oh, people had just done laser cooling, magneto-optic trapping, and a few devices, which was really spectacular. And people got the Nobel Prize for that in 1997. But my understanding was the field of cold atoms has now reached a very high plateau and for a number of years, I could really do wonderful research in an exciting field. But I had no clear idea and no expectation that five years after I joined the field, the best was still to come. With the advent of Bose-Einstein condensation, the field just exploded. So if I generalize my experience, I would say, if you want to, you know, if you want to be a successful scientist, choose your field. You have, you have to choose a field, you're excited about it, but you also want to choose a field which somewhat objectively has potential for major developments. 
But then it's also really a question of luck, whether you hit the jackpot or not. I can add something on that. In fact, I wanted to say exactly what Wolfgang said, that the, the, the word luck is very important. I started uh, much earlier uh, than Wolfgang, back in the 1960s when I was do, doing my thesis work. I, I was lucky to start in, in science at the time when the laser was invented. In fact, it was started two or three years after the first laser had appeared. And immediately it was quite clear that the laser was opening a lot of very fascinating perspectives. Uh, uh, we did not think, we could not imagine all what was possible with lasers. But I remember, for example, one day, uh, Claude Quentanucci that we already mentioned came into my lab and told me there is this this uh, uh, guy who has a very strange idea to use lasers to cool atoms. It was a paper by Ashkin published in 1968. It was the first paper in which it was said that you could manipulate the external degrees of freedom of uh, atom with light. The lasers were completely unable to do that at that time. They were not precise enough, they were not monochromatic enough, powerful enough. But still, this brings us the idea that uh, there was a world which was opening. And I remember at that time when I was doing just atomic physics, I had a lot of friends, uh, student colleagues, who told me, why are you doing this field? This is a very old field. We all know about atoms. You are just taking spectra. You are doing something which is tedious and has no interest. But I had the feeling that there were some very interesting things ahead. And then you have to develop and to go on. And the first, first stage of my career when I did experiments, it was nothing very exciting, but I was learning how to get more and more information from laser, how it was possible to to use them as tools to do more and more refined things. And now look at what happens in the last 50 years with lasers. You, lasers have been used to discover gravitational waves, which was completely unheard. We didn't have any idea about that. Lasers have been used uh, to build clocks, which have unprecedented uh, uh, precision and very small uncertainties. Uh, you can test general relativity with, with lasers. You can do a lot of things which we could not even imagine. And you have, of course, all the development of ultra cold atom physics. And so you, you have to be lucky to enter into a field, but you enter into the field because you are curious, not, not because you will get a Nobel Prize uh, uh, later. This is something which uh, you should not think about because th there is a lot of uncertainties, a lot of luck into all this. Uh, what you have to do is to to be sure that you are passionate and that you really want to, to contribute to, to science in general and, and not to have a specific idea in mind about uh, about uh, doing something absolutely fantastic. Uh, how about uh, Professor Gam or McDonald? I think uh, uh, I'm the juniorist here, so so Alan goes with his longer experience. <laughs> Mike Adana, uh, Professor, your microphone is, is yeah, mute. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, uh, I, I wasn't terribly scientifically ambitious. Uh, I wish I, you know, uh, lo looking back at my life in science, I kind of wish I, I uh, um, b uh, understood earlier uh, in my career about doing important work. So, you know, just doing scholarly science is already lots of fun. And uh, that's, uh, I was, you know, um, uh, maybe um, too content uh, with that. And, uh, but uh, I think I recognize now the, uh, you know, the wise words uh, of uh, uh, the two um, Nobel Prize winners who spoke before me that, uh, yeah, um, the first rule is to be lucky. <laughs> no, and the zeroth rule perhaps is to choose a field where you think uh, there's an opportunity to, there are lots of things that aren't understood and there's an opportunity to make progress. And um, and that of course takes, takes some scientific judgment. I was also struck by what Professor Arouche said about uh, being patient and building up your skills and building up your intuition. 
And uh, I, I do think that, um, you know, uh, uh, I think it's also very important if you pick a field where there's, you think there's a chance to discover new things, uh, you have to be patient and uh, not worry that much about whether, you know, you get lucky <laughs> or not. <laughs> And uh, uh, just enjoy new, uh, discovering new things. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Professor Cam, uh, is there anything to share? I think you have. Yeah. Already... yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let me add to this one. Uh, one of uh, my saying, which probably annoys more people than usual, and Talon knows me well, I, it's one of my hobbies. I usually say, uh, <laughs> say all Nobel Prizes are accidental, but some are more accidental than others. So, yeah, so it has many, many connotations you can think about those. But uh, speaking more seriously, you will hear a lot about luck, about serendipity, especially serendipity, but there is also rather sad truth that when you uh, want to be a top scientist, you have to be at a top place, especially as an experimentalist. If you say at Peking University or Tsinghua University or somewhere in a developing countries, it's completely different uh, range of luck you have to do. And it's, this refers not only to the an experiment, this also refers to theory, because if you are surrounded by knowledgeable colleagues with uh, peer pressure, with background knowledge, then you have your chances of getting lucky is like uh, uh, in a lottery when you know two or three numbers for sure out of seven. So choose uh, a top place where uh, where to do your research, or at least very close to the top. That's all what I can say. Okay, okay. Very uh, good suggestions. Uh, now we still have uh, some time left. We can further discuss on the previous speeches or discuss other topics relating to the section theme. Okay. Uh... Well, I'm... I'm happy to make another comment to the last question about the question of luck or something accidental. Uh, I am, I've seen in my research career that sometimes I was really excited about an idea. I said, if we do this in this experiment, it can really change the field. And it was a good idea. It was a big publication, but when you, when you apply a new method to cold atoms, sometimes you see an effect, but then the atoms heat up because the effect you want to create has also, a, because of technology or, or sometimes because of fundamental reasons, when we, when we manipulate atoms with light and we want to do, them, to do some new quantum science, sometimes they are heated up by the light because they do spontaneous scattering or other things. So in other words, you have something in mind, you want to create some Hamiltonian with some special properties, but the Hilbert space is bigger and there is some dissipative coupling to a bigger Hilbert space and that spoils it. So in other words, I want to say is I had many ideas. I was like, wow, this is my next big idea. And then it was just a good idea, but it didn't really take off. So the message I always give is that you have to be creative. You have to create many ideas. And I would I sometimes say in my labs, you know, here we need to have five or 10 excellent ideas. And when we execute it, maybe one of them is a big one. And, you know, I've just seen it with one of my labs. I told them two years ago, here are three ideas, three big things you can do in the next year or two. The first one uh, didn't work so well because of collisional properties of atoms. We, we, it would, would have been much more difficult to do and we dropped it. The second one led to a nice paper. We wanted to suppress collision, so it's a, we did it, but we didn't get the big factor we wanted. And now we are working on the third one. And the third one looks as if it works even better than we thought. So I'm just saying, you need ideas, you need excellent ideas on first pass on discussing it, they all look good, but then you have to follow through and execute. 
and hopefully one of the idea remains, which is then hopefully changing the field and has a big impact on science. So you need statistics, and, and that's actually why people, often people who won the Nobel Prize, have actually had multiple contributions to the field because the one which led to the Nobel Prize was just the best of many. So if you have only one or two or three really good ideas in your life, the probability that one of them is really changing the field is rather small. But if you have 10 or 20 ideas, your chances are higher. Uh, Professor Gam, uh, I have a, a quick question on graphene because everybody knows 2D materials. Uh, everybody talks about the killer applications of graphene. So do you think, uh, what's the killer applications of graphene? And do you think the 2D material can replace silicon in the future? Patriotic about graphene because I always thought that our second paper about uh, two-dimensional atomic crystals was more important than the one which was acknowledged by the Nobel Committee. Yes, I'm kind of, I like two-dimensional materials. It's a new uh, 200, uh, sorry, uh, two decades ago, 20 years ago, we didn't know that there is such a huge range of two-dimensional materials. And it's all refers to what particular subjects. Okay, some graphene have shown beautiful physics properties in terms of physics and, and have continued to reincarnate itself every five years. The latest was Alan McDonald reincarnation, not himself, but twisted graphene. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it, you are talking mostly about probably semiconductor applications. Uh, I think uh, uh, since uh, 2010, I thought uh, that other two-dimensional materials, learning a little bit what industry needs, two-dimensional materials have much better chance of at least the nearest future uh, to go into applications. So I think when people would get uh, wafers, the same size of wafers, or say molybdenum disulfite or titanium diselenite, uh, chances are 100% that the industry will have to take it on because it's thin, it's flexible, uh, it has not all those problems graphene has with the band gap. So it's more straightforward applications, at least niche applications. But, uh, you know, uh, quite well, it took silicon how many, 70 years before it managed to go into real consumer products. So we, we have to wait and push and no one knows where the next breakthrough uh, will come from. That's the beauty of science and that's the beauty of experiments. Um, you, you don't know. It's pulling out of my direction. Any more comments or? We still have five minutes left uh, and then we can uh, Hello, can I read a short question? Okay, sure. So, okay. so I have a short question so about this disorder uh, induced uh, with the enhancement of electronic inter interaction. We know that uh, disorders can also result in localization. So where can we find the balance if we believe that disorder can enhance the electronic interaction that might be responsible for the uh, high TC? So where to find the balance? Is my question clear? Uh, uh, I think so. You know, I think probably we know that disorder is always present in cuprate uh, crystals, but I think it's unlike like seems unlikely that it's really the cause of high TC. Yeah. Um, uh, coming back to uh, your slides, uh, you showed, you know, this A one. Uh, uh, um, so being large and correlated with TC up right. until a certain point in the phase diagram, if I understood the... Right. Uh, and then beyond that, maybe that's where the Hall density jumps. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't see an A1, but you still see super high temperature superconductivity mm -hmm. over there, right? Mm -hmm. 
So there may be a certain regime, for example, very low doping, mm -hmm. where indeed there is a correlation, as you were suggesting, between uh, between linear and T resistivity, which may well be, uh, it's not really maybe known yet for sure, but it's uh, quite plausible that it's um, uh, linear and T resistivity is, do, is um, a product of disorder in strongly correlated electron systems. Uh, and, uh, but um, I don't think the experimental evidence says that it's a necessary ingredient for high, te for high temperature superconductivity. Thanks uh, you to all the laureates and the presenters today. Thank you for attending this WRA Young Scientist Forum. Our four laureates share their experience doing groundbreaking research. Our three young scientists show their reasonable interesting research results. If you have additional questions for the presenters, you can ask them in the chat feature in the Zoom and the presenters may answer you or you can connect with the speaker one-on-one -on -one through a private message or meeting. And now the entire process of the form has ended. Have a good night and see you next time. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the nice okay, talk. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks so much.